tonight, I would like to share three of my biggest passions with you. Now, three perhaps sounds like too much for one TED talk, but I'll explain to you how those three passions are related. You see the first of these passions already on the screen. So, as you heard in the introduction, I'm interested in life, but I'm also a physicist. So I'm a physicist working at the interface of physics and biology. And I want to know how living cells work. And to understand this question, we are building minimal cells, artificial cells, that can mimic certain behaviors of cells. And you see an example on this slide. Now my second passion may at first sight seem unrelated. It's these two cute little boys, and they are my kids. Now, I'm showing you this, of course, because this is a unique chance to show them off to a very big audience. <laughs> but I also have a more scientific reason, and I'll explain that to you. The curious fact about these two kids is that several years ago, about six years ago, they did not exist. At the time, it was just me and my husband. But then, one thing led to another, <laughs> And this thing happened twice, and on two occasions, nine months later, these boys were born. Complete and healthy boys made up of many cells. So this explains the relation between my first two passions, right? So I really would like to understand how it is possible for one cell to grow out into an entire living human being. Now, to dive into this question, I need to explain to you what cells really look like. And I don't know what image you have in mind. Typically, if you would remember something from a random biology textbook, you will remember a picture like the one that you see here. So cells are usually shown as bags, and they are mostly filled with water and organelles and your DNA. And essentially, they look like a potato. And it's kind of hard to, to figure out how these potatoes could build a whole human being. And actually, they don't, because if you would visit my lab and you would use one of our microscopes, and you would look at a cell taken from your body, you would not see potatoes. So what you would see would very much depend on which tissue you are looking at. So if you take a cell from your skin, then you will see actually this. It's definitely not looking like a potato. If you would be able to extract a cell from your brain, it would look completely different. So as it turns out, in all tissues we have cells that have different shapes, and those shapes are tailored for their functions. Now if you're patient and you keep watching through the microscope, you will not only see that they have distinct shapes, but also that they're constantly changing their shape. And in fact, the fact that they're constantly changing their shape is extremely important for embryonic development. Imagine you have to go from one cell to 10 to the power 14 cells to build a whole human being. So what do you need to do for this? Well, this individual cell needs to split, and it needs to do so many, many times. And it does so by actually changing its shape. So as you can see in this movie, there's one cell, and then it actually contracts in the middle, it does it autonomously, and it can split into two. Now, that's one thing that you need to do. Another thing that you need to do if you want to make a human being is that you need to make complex tissues, such as your brain or your gut. And cells, again, do this by changing their shapes. So you have tissues uh, in the beginning, and then somehow they need to reshape themselves, they need to fold themselves, and they do this by forming sheets that collectively contract. So this is another movie where you see a sheet of cells in an early fruit fly embryo, and they're, con they're all at the same time constricting in order to fold up to form a gut. So how is this possible? Well, we do know something about this. So we actually know that cells derive their shape from kind of a skeleton. We actually call it a cytoskeleton. So it's a little bit analogous to the bony skeleton that you have in your body, that we all have in our body to keep us upright. So it, this is what gives the cell its shape. But there's a big difference if you look at the scale. So our bony skeleton, well, let's say optimistically it's two meters, 
Whereas if you look inside an individual cell, this molecular skeleton is made up of tiny, tiny molecules. And that makes them very dynamic. So if you look through a microscope, you see that this molecular skeleton is continuously moving and it's extremely adaptable. And actually, it serves a dual function. It's not just bones of the cell, but it's also the muscle. And this is because there's amazing little molecules, proteins, inside your cell, and they're able to exert tiny pulling forces on the skeleton. And those are the forces that allow cells to cont contract, for instance, to divide or to form these tissues. So we know who is responsible for it, which proteins are responsible, but we don't know how they really work together. Now, this is a question that has been studied for quite a while, but it has always been studied by biologists. So how would a biologist study this? Well, the typical approach would be a top-down approach. So that means that you choose a model organism, and very often this turns out to be fruit flies, and then you take this organism and you use genetic modifications or drugs, and you change one molecule inside this fly, and then you look through a microscope at the outcome. Now this is in principle, of course, a really powerful approach. You can learn which molecules are important for the fruit fly development. But there is also a limitation, and this is that if you consider what is inside a cell, it's thousands of molecules, and they're all interacting with each other. So if you change one molecule, you're very likely to mess up multiple processes at the same time. So how are you ever going to be able to link cell cellular skill behavior to the interactions of individual molecules? So actually a few years ago, physicists, including myself, started to enter this field. And this really changed the game. Because the thing is, physicists are very different from biologists. So physicists really like simple problems. And a fruit fly is clearly a very complicated problem. So what physicists, like myself, like to do is to somehow make this problem more simple. And how to make it more simple than to turn it actually around, invert the problem. So instead of going top down, why not go bottom up? So what, does, what do I really mean by this? What I mean is that you take components from the cell, you purify them, you put them together into a test tube, and you just figure out how many of these components you need to get a certain function. So how does it work? Well, maybe I should illustrate that with an example actually from our own lab. So we asked a really simple question. We wanted to understand how these amazing mole molecules that exert tiny forces, the motor molecules, allow cells to contract. Now, because we knew that it's these motors that are responsible, we thought it should be enough to take just two components. Take the molecules, take the filaments that build the molecular skeleton of the cell, put them together into a little box, and this should do the job. So let's see if it does. So we use a microscope, and I don't know how you like your viewing experience, but we didn't like this. We were actually deeply disappointed with this, because nothing much is really happening here. So apparently, we are missing something. What is it that we're missing? And unfortunately, it took us quite a long time to figure this out. And of course, when I give you the clue, you will see that this, um, in retrospect, is actually really simple. There's a very nice way to think about this. If you just imagine the molecular skeleton like a game of Mikado. So I don't know if you have played this game. If you're good at it, you have this stack of sticks and you pull out one of the sticks without disturbing the rest of the pile. Now, that's exactly what was happening in the movie I showed. These molecular motors are pulling the filaments of the skeleton, but they're not affecting the rest of the skeleton because there's no connections. That's what we're missing. We need to tie the sticks together. And then if we pull on one, we'll upset the whole pile. And actually, that's something that cells figured out, figured out a long way before we did. They figured out we need to put proteins at those junctions to tie them together. And you see a sketch here on the slide. You see that there's proteins in the cell, and there's actually many of them. And they all serve the purpose of connecting the skeleton together. So we basically just purified one of those. We added them to our minimal cell. 
And lo and behold, indeed, apparently we just need three components in order to rebuild the contractile behavior of a cell. Now that's nice, and it's also an important discovery because now this allows us to actually have a predictive computer model that can predict contractile behavior of cytoskeletal systems having as ingredients the activity of these motor proteins and the connectivity of the network. So you see here an example of such a computer model. And actually the surprising conclusion of all of this was that cells, or at least contraction of cells, can be described by a model that is extremely general. It's a model that you may perhaps have come across when thinking about the World Wide Web, about social media, about economy. It's called percolation theory. And this is something that applies very generally to random networks. You see it also every day. If you would take a walk in the forest, you may notice that often parts of the forest are cleared. And this is done on purpose to prevent forest fires from spreading across the entire forest. So this is predictable by percolation theory. You need to reduce the connectivity in the forest to prevent fires from spreading across. And similarly, with the annual flu vaccinations, you have to vaccinate enough people so that you reduce the connectivity so that this, this flu does not take over the entire population. So all of this is actually described by one very general model that also applies to cell contraction. So now, what is the further game plan? Well, the further game plan is actually to keep following this type of bottom-up approach. So what we are doing every day in the lab is to increase the complexity of our minimal cells. And now you may wonder, where does this end? What is the end goal, right? Is it actually the end goal to build life in the lab? Well, for sure, I should say that's not my end goal. I'm actually very happy with the specimens that nature provided to me, or that I provided myself. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, really, the goal for me is to understand life. How can it emerge? How does it work? Now, obviously, this bottom-up approach from a physicist is not the only route you should follow in order to understand life. We really need to do this together with other people. And actually, that's my third passion, the last one I want to reveal today. This is that every day I have the privilege of working together with biologists on this important problem of understanding life and coming at it from two different sides. Thank you.